Okay, let's continue, guys. We've been looking at children's sports, the guidelines and rights for children in sports. Uh, and children are defined from the age of 0 to 12, meaning the ones that are 13 and older up to 19 are youth. And this is difficult to see, but uh, and we're not going to go very deeply into this. But on account of uh, the children's rights uh, and the experience of uh, dropouts in teenager or amongst teenagers in sport, uh, it was also developed um, a guidelines for for youth sport, um, and this happened in in the 90s. And uh, there are obviously different things here, uh, as this is in Norwegian, by the way, as uh, there are children rights uh, to be diverse, creative environments for everyone, regardless of uh, desire to become a world champion one day, uh, should meet a positive, safe environment, etc., etc. But one thing that is very important here uh, is what we also talked about in children's sport, but this participation or active participation um, um, to be a part of deciding uh, the activity, practices, etc., etc. That's a very important part here. And also to uh, motivate youth to engage uh, in the organization of their sports not only as participants or coaches, but as members of boards, for instance, the board of the sport club. And you know, you, you know that the Idrettskets, uh, <laughs> that they were here talking to you about this youth networks, et cetera, et cetera. That is directly a part of, uh, of uh, this whole idea of, of youth sport. Um, participation, inclusion, for youth to be able to help uh, defining or deciding what sport should be, but was also what their sports future should look like. So there are clear gui guidelines uh, as well. With the idea that more youth should stay longer in sports. How many of you are so-called dropouts, dropping, dropping out of sports at the age of, uh, or in youth, 13, 14, 15, 16? One, two, three, four, more? Changing sports at that age, maybe? Five, six? Yeah. So it's very, very common. It's very representative, or probably not as representative as for the society, <laughs> because you, you guys are more interested in sports than others. But, um, but it's very representative. It's very common. So, so NIF wants to combat that in order to make sports for all. Because, as critics would say, NIF is an organization for all, but as long as people drop out because the opportunities are not there for them yet, then NIF isn't for all. And how then do we legitimize that NIF gets so much governmental funding, for instance, instead of, uh, of a tourist foreign, which has just as many people walking in, uh, in the mountains, or um, anything else, all those uh, training or gyms, that people go to gyms. They don't get any government subsidies to buy equipment, but maybe that covers a, a, whole, a whole different group, which is also part of all. So there might, and, and probably, or maybe, there will be changes in this as well, uh, on the voluntary organization and the more uh, prof uh, professional or, or uh, commercial sector. Yeah. It's a very typical, yet very <laughs> sad story, and it's a very 
It's a typical violation of uh, children's rights. Punishing you, in a sense, because you uh, want to do other things, too. It's not, it's not how ideally sports should, uh, underneath, should be organized in a national voluntary organization with government funds. That's a very, very important. Uh, then there are policies that needs to apply for everyone. Let's move on. Um, these are children's uh, children in INIF, and you can see it's quite a high number of children. There are there are slightly more boys than girls, but we are reaching almost. Uh, this is from 2010. 450,000 youth, no children, between 6 and 12 in sports, in NIF. And we see that majority of these, or most children and youth, play football, followed by skiing, handball, gymnastics, and swimming. These are the five largest sports in NIF. And for girls, the picture is quite uh, slightly different. Football is <laughs> the least popular, but it's increasing football now at, amongst girls too. Gymnastics, handball, swimming, skiing, football. So it's slightly different, but there are still many, many, um, well, <laughs> bottom line is that there are many children in Norwegian sport, and these are the most popular sports. And why is this important, to keep all these children in sport and the youth in sport? This is touching upon uh, other courses that you will have. Activity, activities, uh, training, activities. We have clear rec recommendations for the, from the government directorate of health, for instance, saying that children and youth between 5 and 17 should be active at least 60 minutes per day. How many hours do we have uh, physical activity in school? A week. Four? Is it that many? Yeah, but not yeah, but children like uh, primary school, one or two. And then you have sometimes uh, activities uh, team <laughs> activity in between, uh, but organized it's not that many. Pisak, pisak activities. Some of you are going to uh, be uh, interns now at uh, the schools around in Molde. You will provide physical activity, You're right? Kwam, are Salandro, Kwam, yeah. Many youth and children are not active 60 minutes a day, and that's that is they uh, they define that as a problem, possibly. Nine-year-olds, 95 percent of the boys, and 75 percent of the girls are active enough. Um, these are old stats, but this is rather new. Uh, from 2008, I think, there was this report. From 2000, the activity level also have increased with 6, no, 10% among bo girls and 5 among boys. <coughs> so there is more activity. Children are getting more active. And this is also from Oslo. 55% 55 of 15-year-olds in Oslo meet the recommendations of 60 minutes. All of a sudden, I wonder, the new guidelines increased last year. So I'm wondering if this might be, be uh, wrong, if it's 60 or if it's uh, 75 or something. But um, anyway, I'll find that out. Amongst the 15-year-olds, 54% of the boys and 50% of the girls are active enough. We see the dropout here. They're dropping out from sports, for instance. Um, they stop doing activities. Why do they stop doing activities? Physical activity. Why do we stop? The reports show us that there are, you, if you have a, this big pool of, of children and they start doing activities, it's not, it's not not normal that people drop out. It's very <laughs> normal that they drop out. 
other interests, for instance, other friends. You want to spend your time with uh, doing something else. Uh, some are very ambitious in school. They don't have time for this. All of a sudden, you need to practice uh, four, uh, four times a week. Uh, or uh, you're not selected to be on the team. It's boring. Uh, you're not look or you're not um, given attention by the coaches. You quit. There are many, many reasons why people quit in sports. But we see that only half of the girls are active enough. And that's actually a bit of a problem for sports and for NIF, which means that NIF is actually only, not, uh, not, not all of these are NIF, in NIF either. They're not actually providing sport for all. People are quitting. The activity level for 15 years old year olds is 43% lower than nine year olds. And this is also pretty, there's a typical tabloid headline. 15 year olds are more sedentary, sit the mile still, than the age group 65 to 85. Uh, and that is a problem. Why? Health issues? Maybe? Down the line? We know that if you have an active lifestyle, if you learn this, this pattern of being active and you enjoy the activity, it doesn't have to be organized, then you will continue to do this later. Maybe that's one of those things. This is also interesting from Mörrumsta, from our county. 4% of youth asked are never so active that they sweat or feel exhaustion. That means 96% are do that. But it's still that you never sweat, you never exhausted. 4%, it's quite a lot. And 8% never sweat or feel exhausted outside school. Only in school. And we also know that Physical education in school is one of those things that often you either love or you hate. 50 I think it's 50% of youth say that they don't like physical education in school. It's uncomfortable, doesn't, it's not a good subject for me. I hate it. And if we can't make, and that's also <laughs> in another subject, if we can't make that fun, we won't provide the um, the desire to do this more, which is the whole idea of physical education in school, is to encourage people to be active after school. I don't know how many of you will, are planning to become teachers. Anyone? Maybe uh, some of you? You? Oh, that's the challenge you will hear about in, um, in uh, if you go in the PE of physical education study. This is uh, a big problem for physical education. And not a problem, a challenge. Challenge we can do something with. Uh, we just need to rush on, but uh, I think it's important for you to know these stats. And obviously, there might be this bad spiral then. You are not physically active for many reasons. You might, or at least you will be reduced physical shape compared to others your age, which is, yeah, probably your competence, motor competence, lack of experience, depending a little bit on your age, of course, will be worse. You will experience failure because, oh, if I, if I, if I um, compare myself with you, I'm really bad. I don't, I'm not good at this. You feel bad about this. You get reduced motivation. I don't want to exercise because I'm the worst, et cetera, et cetera. So this is vicious circle, a bad spiral. This is the, maybe the extreme side of it, but it's definitely uh, the case for many youth and children. And uh, we know that this might be a problem. Um, we will talk about that next time in relation to to um, what we call social class. What do, what do we create? What kind of, um, what kind of um, tensions are we creating with this if we don't take it seriously? Will that reduce or will that result in a very fit 
part of our uh, population because we know that many, many people are very fit now, maybe more than ever. And then there will be a group of people that are not active at all, obesity, lifestyle diseases, etc., etc. And this gap is becoming deeper and deeper. And we know that these people, they are better educated, they earn more money, um, <laughs> uh, they don't get that ill that often. Uh, so it needs to be, in our social democracy, this needs to be taken seriously. And that, I think, many of you will, um, will experience that in your, in your future works. Maybe not if you're very specific. We're specifically working in with one sport or whatever. But if you're in the Idrettskrets or um, other types of broader perspective organizations, you will see this. Idrets, uh, what would you call it? Aktivitets. It is consulent in a in a commune, for instance. We will, s uh, as I said, we will talk about this class perspective next time. But I just want to show you because this is um, this is just for the from there. This is for okay, it doesn't show, but it's two days ago. Swimming is so expensive that children from uh, poorer families don't participate. M between twenty and fifty thousand. It can cost between twenty and fifty thousand a year to swim, and of course they <laughs> think it's crazy. This is a, a group of parents in in Bergen just a couple of days ago, spending ninety thousand a year practicing um, uh, uh, what do you call uh, kunstlöp, figure skating. That is from driving to and from uh, the facility, going on. Uh, on uh, training camps, equipment, etc., etc. Who has the chance to pay a ninety thousand for your child to to do this? That's when we start talking about a class division in sports, and that's what they talked about. And I recommend you to see it. I think it's online still. Uh, a debate yesterday in uh, NIF about this class division after school. To go to activities, to pay for the activities, it is uh, becoming more and more expensive. Some activities aren't expensive at all. I would say 1700 it's expensive, but it's not compared to other things that requires a lot more equipment. For instance, alpine skiing or uh, equestrian, <laughs> where you need a horse, <laughs> or something uh, uh, like very, very expensive, but still, you have these additional things. You want to go to tournaments. Some uh, clubs make tournaments in, um, in Barcelona for children that are 13. And you're required to go, but of course you need to go with a parent too because you can't send your, your kid to Barcelona alone. And then all of a sudden, this is very expensive. And, and that will lead to some people or children not able to participate. And that's a problem when, when sport is supposed to be for all. And we see this, uh, we've seen much of this lately about the, um, the social, um, the social uh, class uh, or social difference in, in sport. You don't have to be poor. There are poor, we, we can define as poor families that can't send their children. But of course, if you have, say you have three children, you have, you're a single mom or a single dad, and you have to pay 4,000 uh, a year or half a year for that, the, those children. That's a lot of money. And, and also, on top of that, you need to drive to games and cups or, or tournaments. You need to um, pay for the equipment. You're expec expected to come with um, uh, cakes or whatever on the lottery. There are many, many things on top of that. And that makes it a problem. So. Um, I think that NIF will do uh, quite a few uh, moves now in order to combat this uh, because, uh, for instance, to provide um, money to or to say that there is a, a top of how much you can pay, for instance, in a, in a club or how much you can claim and, 
no uh, children's team under the age of 16 should be allowed to go to international tournaments uh, and stuff like that. I would think that there would be something coming. We will see. But we'll talk about this next time too. And we don't have time for that, but you can uh, do it anyway because it's, uh, it's interesting, but not now. <laughs> Is there a causal link between elite and mass sport? Does elite sport develop mass sport? What do you think? Goes both ways. Both ways? Yeah. I think you're right. It was very diplomatic, though. <laughs> Both things is right. <laughs> yeah? I think it has a lot to do with the media. How yeah? the media portrays the sport. For example, like you had uh, uh, Tour de France. Before they started showing it on TV, not too many people were cycling. Mm. But after they started showing it, a lot more people started cycling in the sport. Mm. For example. So I think it has a lot to do with how the media portrays the sport. Yeah. Exposure is important. Good. Uh, there was, there is, was, is one article uh, on this, specifically on this, with a case study that we've uh, been looking at. Uh, Hans Tashile, uh, Norwegian researchers uh, that has done uh, many things uh, in sport management. Uh, and this specific article is about biathlon, she should think. And uh, they're asking, like, how can we say that it's because uh, of elite sports that there are mass sports? That's the uh, or no, that's not the way they say it. They say, does elite sport develop mass sport? And then they discuss this. First of all, they use literature that says uh, both yes and no, actually. <laughs> there, uh, there is, and they use the same points as you guys use, more or less. Uh, but of course, it's too easy to say that elite sports uh, develop mass sports because there are many other factors influencing this. And the point is, uh, the reason to highlight it at all is that um, in NIF, as a volunteer organization, they are responsible for both elite sports and mass sports. As leaders in sports organizations, you will experience, most likely, that there is this tension between the elite and the mass. Uh, saying that if we spend, of course, it's, it's more expensive to have an elite team. Even in Norway, in a not, like, in a not uh, a high international level, but in a high Norwegian level, it's, of course, it's more expensive to, to go from uh, in Molde uh, to Tromsø, Oslo and all the way flying around <laughs> to play games compared to uh, a mass sport activities in your in your uh, village. And the elite sports, top sports, generates or takes more money basically. And then in in clubs, there's always this tension: clubs that have elite and mass tension of how much should the elite sports get. And then the pro elite sports would say that yes, but if there wasn't for us you wouldn't get that much attention. So because we are here as an elite team, the club will grow as mass sport activity. This is the whole mantra of the Olympics, for instance. To argue for the Olympics, uh, it's very, or not to argue for the Olympics, but they're very, um, they use an example from, from Lillehammer in 1994, and they think that they were claiming that the legacy out of of Lillehammer Olympics would be increased activities in the population. That happened just before Lillehammer when they had this increased activity campaign and then you had the games and after that it dropped. It didn't have that legacy. Elite sport didn't necessarily promote mass sports. So that's the outset. That's the first uh, kind of the starting point. They look at biathlon which is a small national sport foration. It's only like, when they looked at it, it was only 5,000 members, which is little and difficult to compare to other bigger ones. 
Uh, but they had a specific goal of increased participation. And many sport federations have that. To, as when we talked about sport federations, they want to have more members, basically. And then they have specific goals. I know that the, the Basketball Federation, for instance, have this very weird goal of having 16,250 members in 2016, something like that. It's so like very specific goals. And they also had that in biathlon. And uh, during, uh, they had a triangulation of, uh, of research methods, which means that they looked at documents, they had interviews, they had surveys, etc. cetera. Uh, and they identified three elements that could explain the increased participa participation in biathlon, because there was an increase of particip participation in, in the period they looked at. And this was also a period where biathlon was big, or became big. Because in Norway, biathlon is, uh, big sport as a TV sport, a very small sport when it comes to participation, as many other sports. For instance, skating. We can actually see skating quite often on TV, but how many skates in Norway? Not very many. Anyway, we have to rush through this, but the first point they raised was the financial bit, the economy. Uh, the media coverage in this period they looked at, it increased. It increased in Norway and it increased, I increased in Europe for many reasons. <coughs> and that generated interest in the population. Uh, in 1999, this media survey of sports asking which sports do you prefer to see? Biathlon was on the sixth, was number six. Football was one and no, uh, skiing was two. In 2004, biathlon was the preferred sport to watch on TV. Followed, I think, by skiing and football. No, football and skiing. Um, so as it got media coverage, obviously, when you have the chance to see something, it followed with uh, population interest. Interestingly enough, uh, biathlon was mostly popular amongst the older viewers. That means it wasn't necessarily that popular amongst the people that were in the um, target group for recruitment. Older viewers from 40 to 60 don't start biathlon. You do that when you are younger. So still, although increase, it increased, it raised, the, the younger viewers preferred football on TV. So uh, that's, that was an interesting fact. But they talk about the relationship, symbiotic relationship. As Norwegian biathletes did better, the media coverage increased. That's what you're talking about. Population's interest generally increased. They got increased market value. It was more interesting to sponsor a biathlon when more people see it. More sponsored, yeah, which means better economy. And then you have this last bit, opportunity to spend more money on mass participation. And that's the key. You need good leadership. You need good strategies in order to spend this money. There is not necessarily a link between mass sport and elite sport unless there are strategies in between that uh, makes this uh, increase, increasing participation possible, or what I should say. Mass sport had to be prioritized, and it was possible for biathlon because of the sponsors and the market interest. Uh, and then some strategies and incentives were made. For instance, we talked about that earlier, about educating coaches. They educated more coaches and a system for educating coaches who knew biathlon and skiing, because that's a kind of a, a special activity. You need to, you need to have shooters, <laughs> you need to have skiers in one. Uh, they subsidized equipment. Of course, it ex it's expensive to buy uh, a rifle. Oh, no, no, what did they shoot with? A rifle? A gun. Um, so they subsidized that. You, don't have to, you didn't have to have your own gun. The different sport clubs 
uh, got equipment. And also, they prioritized uh, female athletes. They hired a woman or a female who should work specifically to recruit females to this sport. And in this period, we had a few female biathletes that did very well. Um, one of them married to a French guy, actually. So she was partly French, too. <laughs> relevant, very relevant. Uh, <laughs> additional factors. Providing facilities. Okay, it's great to promote mass sport activity or participation, but you need somewhere for them to be. Uh, the same with uh, any sport. If you want uh, handball to grow in Molde, you need to have somewhere for them to play handball. Uh, or if you want tennis or ath athletics, you, <laughs> you know athletics, you're going to make plans for the old stadium. Okay, if you remove the athletics or track and field co uh, court, there won't be facilities. Of course, and probably there won't be more um, athletics in Molde then if there are no facilities to do this. So it's, uh, it's crucial to, to provide uh, facilities and opportunities to do the sport, obviously. And for biathlon, that is uh, uh, skiing stadiums with the possibility of shooting, um, shooting rank ranks, uh, shooting courts, whatever. And also, <coughs> that is of course difficult to do something with if you're um, a daily or a manager of a club, but they, claim that they, um, they it generated more interest for the sport when the sport developed. Uh, we know that skiing and biathlon, for instance, have had quite, um, uh, or they changed quite a lot from, uh, for instance, um, they have shorter tracks to be able to see the athletes more often coming into the stadium in big competitions. They have created sprint, and that's also for the interest of the population. Um, and developing the game for them was crucial to make biathlon more interesting to see. Not only going from the stadium, being in the woods, and then coming, shooting, and then you need to see, you need some action. So that's, um, so there were not necessarily a causal link between mass sport and elite sport. It needs to be a strategy as well. That's basically bottom line of the, the findings. And many other uh, research um, articles and researchers show the same. That's about it. To next time, we are talking about gender and social class. Much in the line of what we've done today, but more those two specific uh, topics. And then uh, and that will be the last lecture, I think, before Easter. That's correct. Uh, I sent out an invitation to you guys on Fronter and on the, there's a guest lecture. On Monday, you've ch we've actually managed to change your uh, psychology class with Guy to later, I think, in the afternoon. So that, yeah, just pay attention to the time schedule. Uh, but um, I encourage you to come. I think it's going to be fun. If you're interested in football, or if you're not interested in football, I think you get some. Um, you will get some um, interesting perspectives. And also the Thursday, it's on Olympics politics. It's uh, part of the uh, Master Sport History course, but it's not. Um, it's not uh, sport history. It is sport history, <laughs> but it's not uh, very narrow to, to sport historians. It's um, more of a political as aspect of this. So I hope to see you there, but first, first things first. Enjoy your weekend. <laughs>